hard and I'm still here thankfully um okay so we'll hear from our three speakers and then at the end we'll have a Q&A session um that'll last maybe 20 minutes to a half an hour just depending on um timekeeping throughout the the session um so I'll just give you a very very brief introduction um to connecting communities with peatlands um, I kind of covered it a little bit more detail in our first webinar of the series if you want you can go back and watch that but connecting communities with peatlands is a um is a just transition funded project and it is led by the community wetlands forum and irish rural link and it is a capacity building project for community groups and really what that means is that we're trying to support communities in, in peatland areas in the midlands to be able to transition um, away from peat harvesting in particular the process of industrial peat harvesting and the massive changes that that brings to communities and to build community resilience um, and i suppose that really means that we're engaging with bogs in a different way than maybe we have in the past and looking at them in a different way so this project particularly looks at supporting community groups um, to be able to do that. And in essence, then this webinar series came about from interacting with those community groups and asking them what they need the most. And um, a lot of communities said that they would like some kind of um, knowledge or information around um, bogs and peatlands. So we bring you this webinar series um, that goes and explores what bogs are, the flora and the fauna, peatlands and culture. That's what we're here for this evening. And um, then we also look at climate and, reg and climate regulation and the importance of the bogs in that sense. And then we'll also look at um, the efforts that communities are already making um, around, around the country and in particular the Midlands. So without further ado, um, we're going to just go for it and get stuck into it. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the evening, um, Dr. Ellen O'Carroll. And Ellen, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Um, she's an archeologist working in UCD on the Food Cult project. And um, Ellen has worked as a project director with responsibility for the evaluation evaluation and excavation and survey of archaeological sites that occur, occur at um, Bordnamona peat bogs. And then as well, um, Cathy Moore and has also collaborated on this and she'll be available to answer questions uh, towards the end of the webinar this evening. And Cathy is an established <coughs> expert in Irish wetland archaeology um, and is an in, and in the recording and analysis of waterlogged archaeological wood. So, Ellen, I'm going to ask you to take it away. Great. Thanks, Aoife. Can everybody see the slides, the slide properly? You're not seeing the text. Great. Yes. Uh, OK, so good evening, everybody. And um, we are both delighted that the, commun the Connecting Communities of Peace Peatlands have asked us to talk this evening about our experiences of working in raised bogs and uncovering the archaeological sites particularly at such a pivotal time in the history of these bogs. Because um, as everybody knows, they are now undergoing rewetting and restoration as well as development for say wind farms. So it is time now to sit down and take stock of what we have found beneath the peat layers and how best to preserve and manage them going into the future, as well as engaging with communities in, in managing and understanding and displaying this wonderful peatland heritage that we have. So myself and Cathy have both worked in and on many of the Bordnemona bogs with the Irish Archaeological Wetland Unit, which is based here, was based here at UCD, uh, for Transport Infrastructure Ireland and for the private archaeological companies. So we survey, record and, uh, and have excavated a wide range of archaeological sites, of which I'm going to talk to you today about. Now, I have a lot to get through, so hopefully I won't go over time, but um, We'll uh, speed through the slides. Um, so just, I'm not sure how much people know about the development of the, the raised bogs or the blanket bogs. Um, so the raised bogs developed in the Midlands. You can see the, the purple in, in the middle of, of, of Ireland in post-glacial basins. And they are the finest examples of their type in Europe and probably the world, as is the archeology span that lies beneath them. 
and they occur on land below 130 uh, metres and in the climatic zone where rainfall is between 800 and 900 millimetres per year. And then in contrast, blanket peats, as you can see, the brown on the bogs develop in uh, the western seaboards. Now, the archaeological remains are preserved in these peatlands because of the acidity of the peat, as well as their anaerobic environment. So there's all these archaeological sites and objects that are preserved within these peat bogs. The raised bogs preserve a, a slightly different type of archaeological site than the blanket peat pleats do. Um, the blanket pleat, peats preserve uh, stuff like the cager fields. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the cager field, James Caulfield uh, in, in Mayo. And then the raised bogs are a lot deeper and preserve archaeological sites uh, from the Mesolithic period right up to the recent past. So firstly, I'm going to show you or talk about how these archaeological sites are found in the peat. Secondly, I'm going to give some examples of sites and objects that we have found through time from the earlier periods to the later periods. And then lastly, we're going to look at an area in County Offaly uh, called the Monaghan, which has a remarkable range of archaeological and cultural sites, as well as a vibrant community um, that, that, that's, bit, that's built around these sites and these peat bogs. So how do we locate these sites that are hidden beneath the peat? So sites and objects are, can be located through targeted archaeological surveying, or they can be chance finds by people working on the bog, or during development work, such as the construction of wind par farms, uh, archaeologists will have to go in and look at the, at the bogs uh, before they develop these sites. So as we all know, these Bogs have been milled since the 1950s. Unfortunately for us, the, the drains were cut for draining the peat, uh, can reveal many archaeological sites. Um, and also the sites can be exposed on the field surface as the, the milling machine is going along the peat. And then we go in and we survey the bog and uh, we find the archaeological sites. Um, so these surveys were conducted in the 1990s and 2000s, and there, there aren't very many of them uh, been undertaken at the moment. So this is how the site looks in the drain face. You can see on the left hand side, uh, the, the layer of wood, that's an, actually a Bronze Age site, um, a few thousand years old. Um, that's how it looks like to us in the drain. We get into the drain and we record it. Um, we measure, we describe it and we sample it for dating. So these sites can run along the peat bog for, for tens of metres and we record them in the drain as they go along. Um, and we excavate a small amount of these sites, a uh, very, very small percentage of the sites are excavated. So visually, these are the variety, the, the variety and type of sites that are found during survey work and excavation in our raised bogs. So up in the left-hand corner, you can see a site, a hut site. And then on the right-hand corner, there's Clonfinlock, the habitation site, the, the really important Bronze Age habitation site. Um, and we have um, our platforms, our stake rows, and our trackways that ran across the bog. So people in the past, and also within li living memory, were engaged with our peatlands in many different ways. Um, and I'm going to show you the variety and amount of site types that, that shows this engagement with our peatlands through the past um, from different periods of time. So most of these type of sites you will find in peatlands near you. Um, in, in the peat bogs that, that, that we were talking about. We also can find a window into our past through the many objects found in our peat bogs. So we have found several thousands of objects uh, found um, which are a real tangible connection with the past. So these are some of the objects that are found in our peat bogs from the mundane to the exquisite. So in the top left hand corner, you've got the Darius hoard, which contained over 200 objects spearheads, musical instruments, trumpets, chisel knives. And then we also have the more mundane, like the leather shoe. This leather shoe was found during excavations in Le Monaghan. We have our fish traps uh, found in near Clonfinlock. We have butter churns and, and lots of flints and stone axes, which were uh, everyday objects in the Mesolithic and the Neolithic period. And we also, these are uh, two silver uh, coins that were found uh, actually by myself in Core Hill Bog during the survey, 14 silver coins dating to 1280, so Edward I. So they were lost in the bog 700 years ago and then found um, recently by archaeologists. So that was very exciting. 
So just we'll start at the beginning, um, the Mesolithic site, which many of you may know about it, at Loch Bora, it's 8,000 years old. Um, it was discovered in 1977 and was excavated by the National Museum of Ireland. So this site represents the earliest evidence for human activity in the Midlands. So it's a really important site. Um, the photographs aren't great because it was uh, excavated in the 1970s. But um, the, the excavation showed a number of hearts, um, stone napping areas and spreads of charcoal. And we took samples from the site as archaeologists. We take samples from all these excavations and look at them back in the lab. Um, and the faunal or, or the animal bones and the floral assemblage, assemblage can tell us a lot about what they were eating um, and what the environment was like in the background uh, of these sites. So they were eating red deer wild pig, hares, birds, and fish, and a large quantity of hazelnut shells, which, which were, would be very high in protein. Um, so they would have been hunting. So this site would have been a hunting uh, kind of encampment site at the side of, of the post-glacial lake before the peat developed within the lake. And we also found a lot of flint um, and lithic artifacts within a lot in the excavation. Um, and it's one of the most important archaeological sites in Ireland. So prior to its discovery, it was thought that the first human settlements were all near the coast. So these are Mesolithic people, our first people lived in Ireland, but they actually lived in the Midlands as well. So um, Loch Bore Discovery Park uh, is now located close by to where the site has been excavated and people can engage uh, with this site and learn more about it at the Loch Bore Discovery Park in Offaly. So after the Mesolithic, we have our first farmers, uh, and we also uncover a lot of archaeological sites dated to the Neolithic um, in our peat bogs. So these are uh, Neolithic trackways excavated at Edder Clune in County Longford. We also excavated some at Mount Lucas Wind Farm in County Offaly. So they're narrow, deep tracks constructed from wooden roundwoods, um, and they extend out into the bog for many metres. Uh, many of them aren't actually routeways across the bog from one side to the other, but they're actually accessing the fen peat, which would have been developing at the time that these trackways were constructed. The fen peat uh, contains reeds for thatching and were also seen as fertile grounds for wildfowl. So they're heading out into the bogs, um, accessing the bogs for reeds and resources and wildfowl. We can also date the tracks from the lovely uh, two marks that are preserved on the wooden remains that are preserved in the peat. These ne are Neolithic two marks, and you can see they're they're just as beautifully preserved as uh, as they are as they were when they were made five thousand years ago. They're round and concave um, stone two marks imprinted on the wood. Another rare and unique discovery is this Neolithic stone enclosure. It was uncovered in Ballybeg Bog in Townland, uh, Clunine Townland in County Offaly. It was um, a stone enclosure. Uh, the wall was 1.5 metres wide. It was very wide and it enclosed an internal area of seven by eight metres. So we found, again, we found hearts, we found lithic artefacts. Um, so what was it function? It was probably a temporary encampment um, for, for, the, for the Neolithic people who lived and interacted with the peat bogs in the area. It is now preserved in the peat for future generations to study and interpret. So moving into the Bronze Age, um, it was a, big, a, a time of great change in Ireland. Climate, the environment and the settlement patterns change and we also have copper and bronze being used instead of stone. Um, Again, we find a lot of archaeological sites on the peat bogs. Um, these are three trackways, Bronze Age trackways found in, in Ireland's Midlands. We have Lachine in County Tipperary, Le Mans in County Offaly and Edder Clune in County Longford. Now, these were long stretches of trackway, which actually the majority of them ran from one side of the bog to the other. And they were constructed, you can see Le Mans trackway is constructed of oak split planks laid end to end and pegged in places at intervals. Um, and then these are some of the two marks that preserved in the Bronze Age. And you can see they're very different to the earlier um, Neolithic round concave two marks. These are sharp, 
they're uh, straight and they're they're made with bronze um, axes. You can see the wide axe in the in the middle um, Bronze Age uh, wood, and then the the narrow later Bronze Age Paul Stave axe. This is a habitation site found in Clonfinlock in, in a raised bog. It's Bronze Age. Um, it was excavated over two seasons or two summers by the Irish Archaeological Wetland Unit in UCD. It lies close to the monastic site at Clomac Noise, three kilometres from it. Um, it. It was a site, a series of huts and platforms surrounded by a palisade or a fence. You can see the red dots there. They're, they were ash posts, so the whole site was enclosed by a fence of ash posts and the area that enclosed was 50 by 45 metres. So inside these, these posts, um, excavation revealed two circular platforms, which represented the remains of houses. Um, and then we also had um, a hut, um, and the, the, the houses were made with timber foundations upon which where flagstones were placed and gravel, and we also had hearts, we'd woven hazel wattle to construct the houses. And we found this um, beautiful amber bead underneath one of the hearts or the fireplaces. Um, and we also can tell a lot from the economy from these excavations. Um, this one at Clonfinlock, we found querns, so we know that they were processing cereals, they're eating cereals. The animal bone was taken away, recovered and analysed off site. And we can say the cattle was the most dominant um, animal eaten, followed by pig, sheep and goat. Um, and then there was course where you can see the pottery. So they were um, they were they were making pottery to hold their cereals or their their, their dairy food in. Um, and they were constructed into several pots. They were fishing and they were uh, making butter. It's a, a wooden churn that we found on the site as well. And this is what we can do. Uh, this is a, a this is the reconstruction of the Clanfinnock, the late Bronze Age site. We're fitting all the different pieces of the puzzle together. And this is a fantastic reconstruction drawing of the two houses and the, the hut with the cattle in the background, because we know that they were eating cattle um, beside this, this lake edge. And then it was preserved in our peat box. So coming into the Iron Age, we um, we have platforms as well in the Iron Age. Again, they were constructing these platforms from hurdle wattles, bringing them out onto the bog, hunting, collecting reeds. Uh, we have many of these early Iron Age platforms found on the bogs in the Iron Age. Um, uh, they were also accessing the bog during the Iron Age for bog iron ore. We know from the um, sites excavated along the road schemes that the iron used in these metalworking uh, monastic sites that um, they were using, they were extracting the iron from the bogs and making metal, uh, metal objects from the bog iron ore. And we also have Iron Age trackways. Uh, this is one from Corlay, uh, which is our, probably our most famous trackway, and it has its own museum dedicated to us. It's a wonderful interpretive center if anybody wants to go and visit it. Um, and then we have our, during the Iron Age, we have our uh, bog bodies, which I know um, everybody gets excited about. These are two Iron Age bog bodies that were um, uncovered in, recently in our bogs. Um, one, they they were would have been killed and uh, deposited in, in the bog. Um, and we know the that the the, the old Crohan man um, from uh, scientific analysis uh, ate uh, mainly had a diet of vegetables, whereas a Cluny Cavan man mainly ate meat. And that hairstyle, um, uh, it was they say is the first Mohican um, in in the Iron Age. Uh, it's a kind of Mohican hairstyle, and it was uh, swirled up with a uh, gel, um, a resin that you can only get in Spain and uh, and France. So they were in the Iron Age. They were. Um, importing uh, ingredients from France and southwestern Spain. Um, so for the last few minutes, I'm just going to talk about Le Monaghan and County Offaly, which is an area of great significance, which also has a very active community who engage with their peatlands on many different levels. So at the moment, they're actively seeking funding for the upgrade of their old schoolhouse for display and interpretation of the many archaeological remains uncovered from the area. 
So although there are many dryland sites, including the famous Lamanahan Ecclesiastical Enclosure, the wetland archaeological sites uncovered during our surveys and excavations are intrinsic in understanding the significance of the area and its long use period. So all the archaeological sites uncovered in the bog in Lamanahan are red dots. So you can see there's hundreds and hundreds of bogs of archaeological sites uh, uncovered or found during our surveys in this bog. So if anybody wants to go to their local bog and see what kind of sites are found in their, their local area, uh, you can go to um, that uh, maps.archaeology.ie historic environment and put in your town and name and the red dots will pop up and it'll give you a description of what kind of sites are in your your local community or in your cultural sites in your raised bogs. Uh, so that just there were some really good examples of some uh, trackways. This is an early medieval arc, uh, trackway which ran across the bog for one kilometer. Um, you can see it ran from the dryland island where the monastic enclosure of Lamanhin was across the bog. Um, that, that's me on the bog last summer walking across. So it's amazing that you can still walk on an archaeological site that was built uh, in the 7th century AD, so it was built over 1,500 years ago, and you can still walk along it. Uh, uh, uh. And then that's a picture of the site uh, by Kevin O'Dwyer, an aerial photo. You can see it running across the bog. It's kind of lifted up over the, the peat bog um, because the slabs, uh, it's so deep, and the slabs on the top, they can't mill it, so it's preserved um, on the peat bog. I, I conducted an excavation there uh, maybe over to, over 20 years ago and we could see that it was five, there was five phases of uh, construction of the trackway. There was a gravel on the top, there was wood on the bottom and there was a big oak plank walkway underneath that and it was used for 700 years and you can still walk on it. So it's an incredible site. Um, we also found a crozier on the trackway with the, and the Maltese cross. Um, it doesn't look very significant there, but it's one of our earliest croziers ever found in Ireland. And we also found this leather shoe along the, the, the one of the early medieval trackways. So from these surveys and excavations, we can build up pictures of the puzzle, the jigsaw, put it all together and create a lost community um, in it, it, from the peat layers, the clothes they wore and the rituals they performed. This is a reconstruction of the monk crossing the raised bog over the oak track with his staff and leather shoes en route to the Monaghan Island where the famous ecclesiastical centre lies. So these memories are still alive today where people in the local community can remember their ancestors or their grandparents walking across this bog or this trackway to, to mass. So just to finish off, we also have our later medieval sites. Um, again, these bogs were being used for collecting resources. They were building platforms on the bog. We have several of them excavated from Lamanhan again. Um, so the inhabitants were utilizing the bog land uh, to sustain their way of life in the later medieval periods, possibly during periods of famine or food shortages, or they could also have been hunting hides for the gentry who resided in the nearby McColgan Tower House, which is on the island of Lamanhan as well. So from the Mesolithic right up to the later medieval periods, we can see people interacting with the peat bogs um, in different ways. So just in conclusion, uh, I hope I've shown you that the wealth of archaeological sites and artifacts that have been found in, in Irish peatlands is unparalleled anywhere else in the world. Um, we have a really important collection of, of archaeological and cultural heritage sites in our peat bogs. Um, they are intrinsic to everyday life in different ways throughout different time periods. They were used as communication routes, collection of resources, hunting grounds. And then we also see from our, our objects they were used, they were de depositing rich objects in these ritual and spiritual places. So just moving into the future and the new phase of raised bog restoration, we uh, we need to take stock of what we are uncovered and how best to preserve. So engaging with communities in understanding and displaying these wonderful cultural resources should be a key objective. Sorry. So I'll just end there. Uh, sorry, my battery was running out. Uh, sorry, I went a bit over time. Thanks to Aoife for uh, inviting us to speak. And uh, I'll we, myself and Cathy will we'll take questions at the end. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Alan. Um, yeah, I think this evening is definitely uh, one for the tech gremlins. So uh, <laughs> don't worry about your battery almost cutting out. Um, yeah, that was fascinating. You've made me um, think about when I was uh, 18 and do my leave certain that I wanted to do archaeology and now I kind of regret not doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. You can so still much. do it. You can always go back. Yeah, maybe, maybe in a while. I'm done studying for a while. <laughs> but thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. And um, we've got a couple of questions already um, coming through the chat. So if anyone else does have questions, um for Ellen um you know pop them in now and then I'll be able to direct them towards the end and um, so our next speaker is um Jules Michael and she's a Carlo based community artist and painter and she's also a committee member of the Drum and Bog project which is a voluntary conservation group set up to conserve Carlo's only raised bog um, and since 2019, um, she's been interweaving Drum and Bog with surrounding schools and communities through a series of um, Creative Ireland funded arts projects. So Jules, if you want to share your screen with us. Yeah, and, just give me um, two, yeah. two ticks and I'll, I'll um, uh, ho hope this works. Is that up now? Um, not yet. I don't know if anyone else yeah. can do it. Okay, hang on to, sorry, I'll just try one more. Yeah. Can you see that now? No, can anyone else see it or is it just my screen? Ellen, James? Okay. It's, it's telling me that I'm sharing at the moment. Can, I can see it. You can see it? Yeah. So, okay, go ahead, Jules. Yeah, can Thanks. you see it? Shall I go ahead? Yeah, yes, yeah, I can see it now. Okay. I think my computer is just not cooperating. Um, thanks very much, Aoife, for, for inviting me to speak. And um, what well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm going to, uh, having listened to, to um, Eileen, Drumbog is tiny, um, and it's a real outlier in the whole raised bog spectrum. So, um, and I'm just going to really just run through some of the projects that we've been running on Drum and Bog um, and maybe showing how that we, we hope to kind of build a bit of community around the bog to support it and to a, a kind of a two way thing of, of um, community resilience and um, conservation. So. Um, uh, so Drum and Bog, it's only about 14 hectares and it's the last kind of reigning, remaining remnant of raised bog, I think, in the southeast of Leinster. Um, so it was um, cut, you know, during the war and up to about the war and after it would have been extensively cut for turf, but thereafter, um, not anymore. So it's been kind of abandoned and hidden since then. There was a certain amount of digging out for garden centres um, Pete in the in the 70s and that's actually what we think formed this pool um, so um, and then there was a certain amount of quilcher planting in the 50s and they ran drains across the bog this is an aerial view um, so you can see that it's ringed by a certain amount of self-seeded woodland quilcher planting and then it's quite highly degraded so there's a lot of um, uh, encroachment of birch, um, particularly at one end. So the Drumbog project was formed in 2015 to, to protect the high bog and um, the landowner um, uh, gave us a long lease. Um, and um, I suppose I, I ended up going onto the committee just out of my own personal inter interest with conservation, but then through trying to connect with the local community and everyone who lives down here in South Carlo, um, we, we kind of started um, coming at it from the angle that a, a kind of creative art project is, is a great way to um, forge links with people. And it's a kind of a neutral territory that um, everybody is, is kind of happy to participate. And um, so this is just another shot of the bog and a sphagnum pool, which is there, which, which we think again is from the garden center um, digging out. Um, so we achieved some funding in 2019 to start connecting with the local primary schools. 
So it was very much a crossover between going in and, and um, working with the children and going through the, the, the specific kind of science of raised bogs, um, the wonderful plant of sphagnum moss and what that is, um, and then um, a certain amount about it being so important as a biodiversity habitat and its kind of support as, as I suppose a sanctuary because it's surrounded by quite intensively, quite intensive farming. Um, so it was that kind of crossover between classroom science, children visiting the bog, um, and then we ran, um, I worked with them over a series of weeks to make uh, various art projects and it all kind of came together in a big event in a local hall. Um, this is an, another segment of a kind of a biodiversity Jenga that the kids were putting together. Um, and then we, we staged an exhibition and that was really the first time many local people had kind of heard of Drum and Bog. Um, some of the older folk roundabout would still have some stories about it, but they tend to dismiss it because the peat apparently was poor quality. Um, and, uh, you know, they used to lose cattle into bog holes. So on the whole, people regarded it as a bit of a nuisance. And um, so when we staged this event in Drummond Hall, it was the kind of reintroducing it to a whole new generation, which was kind of nice. And um, I, I suppose I kind of have the belief in kind of continuing and trying to build on what we've 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 done before. So we we progressed from that. Um, this is a song project that we're working on with a local composer um, who's going through the schools at the moment. And um, while the art projects were happening, uh, we also the Drumbug project achieved leader funding um, to do. Uh, the baseline surveys of um, all the science because we knew that before we did anything the um, we'd have to have the, the science in place to inform the hydrology and the drain blocking and all, all that side of things that needed to be done so there's kind of two-pronged hard science and then trying to uh, raise awareness about the bog itself so it was kind of out of that that we connected with two paleo archaeologists from UCC and paleo archaeology um, as I understand it is looking at ancient pollens and by um, reading what's there it, it tells a story about surrounding um, uh, farming practices, um, it shows what sort of plants would have been growing and um, roughly um, the, the, the very broad rule of thumb is that for each centimetre of peach you go down you go back 20 years so this is Rosie and Ben doing some coring in on Drum and Bog and um, running down their sampler and the the, um, the 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 sort of sandy coloured stuff that they pulled up eventually that was um, tremendously exciting because we had gone right down through the um, I'm going to say feet, we've gone down feet and feet and feet, five metres, five and a half metres, and we eventually ended up going right down so that the, to the marl when it was, um, the raised bog was originally a lake, so we went below the fen stage right into the silt at the bottom, which was, um, we did some carbon dating from back then, so we have a, a date for 9,556 years. So, um, so, so that was um, for us a huge thing. Um, and then the big thing was how do we take that information and what do we do with it? Because it's more very interesting, but it's not much good if it's gonna sit in our computers in reports. So um, we, uh, this is another photo of the, uh, you can see that kind of dark, deep bit of band of, of peat is, is the part that they were excavating down to get a decent depth and the hand with the tiny bit of shell in the sandy stuff is a, is a <laughs> nailed shell from when the lake was originally there and that's from a, a snail that was found in the silt so that would have come up from about 9,000 years ago. So it's, it's kind of phenomenal to see the peat sampler coming back up and bringing up this kind of artifact. 
So, um, so they set up a mini lab in the local hall and went through um, with not very massive microscopes, just had a quick look and they could see what was sphagnum and what was some wood fiber that they reckoned was about 5,000 years old. And the green cells there are actually sphagnum moss cells. So, um, I, so we took th this thing of one centimeter um, equals about 20 years. We kind of took that fact. And when we had some transition year students on the bog from some of the local secondary schools, we had a core, um, that's our chairman. He's a geologist and a sculptor. So um, um, people really connect with that thing of you pull up three feet plug of, of peat and the very base of it is 1800 years old or you go down another foot and you go back another 600 years. So that caused a huge amount, it, that, it just seems to provoke some kind of instinctive reaction. So we were trying to figure out how we could kind of capitalize on that, plus the fact that the, um, we got the archeologists, we, we commissioned some micro photos, which is a special camera, which can really zoom in on the minuscule pollens and the diatom, which is that kind of overly beautiful lilac thing, um, for want of a more scientific word, a diatom is a tiny algae I, that lives in the bottom of the lake bed. Um, and then the, the two images on the right are microscopic pollens there from about 5,000 years ago of hazel on the top and then alder on the bottom. So we could tell what was growing around um, the edge of the bog. So um, it was on the back of, of what to do with these beautiful images that we decided we'd stage an event back in the same hall and use it as an opportunity to connect with everybody as much as we could. So um, we got some large scale photos printed off um, on, on kind of artist quality paper, which is beautiful, heavy kind of mat. Um, and set those up in the hall. You can see them here. Um, and then we staged a hose, used it as a kind of a coat hook or a building block to, to stage a series of talks from Ben and Rosie gave a presentation. Um, we connected with the local heritage center in St. Mullins and um, made a big timeline to, to kind of physically manifest that stepping back in time because there's no, um, unlike Eileen, we have no artifacts from Drum and Bog. There's no, there's nothing as far as we know. Um, there's nothing that surfaced kind of locally over the years other than turf. So, um, and also we're trying to kind of frame it that Drum and Bog isn't an island, that it's connected to its community. So we're always looking for ways to, to kind of form that kind of web of connections. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So um, another speaker or <coughs> not speaker maker is an historical woodwright, um, Owen Donnelly, and he came and did a workshop, cut some wood off the bog. <coughs> um, he, he uses ancient practices and tools, so it kind of fit together. Um, <clears throat> that's a photo of the, some of the artifacts that were stepping through the time. We made a big long table that was eight meters long to, to try and represent the depth that the original peat would have been and how each centimeter goes back 20 years with, with our, um, artifacts staged out. Um, a local, because of the bi biodiversity aspect, the um, Birdwatch Ireland, um, Mick Wright, who's monitoring the barn owl nesting bites boxes um, in Carlo in Kilkenny, he came and gave a talk about barn owls and how um, important the bog is as a habitat for them. Um, and we connected with the men's shed in Burris, who built us this wonderful barn owl nesting box from a Birdwatch Island template. And then um, there is someone in the area who has a rescue bar now, and she came with her owl. I'm sorry, I can't put up a video, but again, it was just a ways of trying to build on the, the pollen samples and um, create an overall awareness of, of the bog and its kind of depth and breadth. 
of of what what it presents to us. So these are just some photos of Rosie giving part of her her presentation. School children, um, Minister Malcolm Newland came. It was just towards the end of COVID, so we're really lucky that people could come over the three or four days. Um, and then there's a local centre in Bagnall Stand for adults with intellectual disabilities, which is a, um, a huge, um, it's a wonderful place. So they um, came and visited as well. Um, so, uh, and then Fiona McGowan um, had come and she had, as part of the leader survey, she'd done a, a, an ecologist report. So she came back and gave a walk and a talk about the bog. And um, so people really got to experience it as well. And I think that's something that people need to do because you never you know, it's funny how a bog just provokes some kind of instinctive reaction in us. I don't quite know what it is. It's the emotional connection um, that it seems to trigger. So, <clears throat> so th this all came out of the pollen samples and we want to kind of keep building on that rather than it just kind of stopping and starting. So we're now working through with, you can see that the, um, I'm going and working with the center in Bagnallstown and we're using the pollens as source material. There's a whole kind of fabric drawing um, making project going on at the minute, which will conclude over the next two months. And we're gonna make a huge banner. I think there's 45 or 50 people participating. So, um, these are a couple of slides of that in progress. And um, that's really it. So this is a um, the micro photo of the sphagnum moss pollen and um, an aerial view across the bog and looking back up through Carlo and, <clears throat> and the black stairs. And I suppose for me, it's a kind of a, uh, a metaphor for uh what can be done and what the bog really is doing that it seems to be um an amazing uh uh i don't know site for people to come from many different walks of life and to kind of um connect find, and find some kind of common ground so at the moment because it's still kind of relatively early days access as such we've generally um, managed it with schools and tours and that kind of thing but the next phase will be to establish walkways and um, <clears throat> all all the way through we're finding that more and more people are saying to us oh I went down there or I read about that in the newspaper and it's it's funny how such a small tiny little place seems to be reaching outwards and um, forming connections with people <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, I don't have any water. So I, I think that's it. I think that's my, um, I'm sorry if I run over, but um, it's just to give an overview of, I think, some small, subtle, slow work um, that we just feel we just keep building and building and building and it's gathering momentum. Thank you so much, Jules. That was incredible to see. Um... And to hear the story of, of the Drum and Bog project and the work that you guys are doing in County Carlo. And, you know, and I think what you said there just towards the end that, you know, the bog is a place where you can unite, unite people from, from different walks of life. And I think at the, at the moment, you know, we kind of are looking at bogs as, as de divisive places. Um, so I really like that, you know, you can come at it from that perspective and it is a place where you can unite people and there's a lot more that we can do on a bog um which is quite evident from what you you guys are doing um in county carlo so thank you so much for your presentation um i thoroughly enjoyed it thank you um, thank you for having us along thanks you're welcome um we have a lot of questions as well that have come come into the chat so it's definitely stirred up some uh some conversation there so um We'll come back to that towards the end and we have one more um one more speaker this evening um shane heinen and he's a photographer and visual artist based in kildare and in 2019 he completed his mfa in photography at ulster university um and 
he has been the recipient of the 2020 Emerging Visual Artist Bursary Award from Kildare Arts Service. Um, and he also had his first solo exhibition um, in 2021 in the Riverbank Arts Centre uh, in Newbridge, County Kildare. So Shane, if you want to take it away. No problem. Um, can everyone hear me and see that presentation? Get my name yes. on up there. Yeah. Good. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here tonight. Thanks, Aoife, and the community, community Wetlands Forum for asking me to come and talk. Um, as Aoife noted there, I'm a photographer and a visual artist. Um, prior to that, uh, I worked for almost 20 years as a structural engineer. I did a career change in 2018 um, and have been working at photography and visual arts since. Uh, I also have a degree in structural engineering. I have a postgrad cert in wind energy systems. So I kind of have a, a kind of a, a funny kind of a relationship with renewable energy and bogs and stuff. Um, I come from a very rural area in Kildare and we have a local bog. Um, it's kind of it's known as Carby bog, but locally it's known more as Knockhorn bog. Um, I've been asked to kind of join this committee in the last couple of months, so I have a different hat as well now. Um, so Carby Bog uh, is communally owned since 1906. Uh, it was handed over from the, the gentry landlord at the time when he was leaving, uh, and it's been managed ever since by the local committee and trustees. Uh, we're still cutting turf, um, but we're exploring options to transition away from the from the turf cutting uh, and that's partly the reason why I was asked to come on board. Um, now I'm going to discuss uh, some ideas that I that I looked at through my MFA when I was doing research on bogs and landscape and stuff like that and I'm going to have a lot of photographs there's very little text but there is one or two slides that might have a lot of text but don't get too worried about it. Um, so I'm, I'm actually quite interested in, in how Ireland's relationship with bogs has changed over time and it's currently changing at the moment. Um, uh, so like in, in pagan times, they were a spiritual centre uh, and as was mentioned earlier there in the archaeology, like bog bodies and bog butter were found uh, and they were offerings that were uh, put forward at the time. Uh, and, it, and there's written records that suggest that in pre-famine times, bogs were still growing uh, and people were afraid of them and feared them. Um, following that, kind of just pre-famine, we had a huge um, increase in population. And this led to a kind of a land hunger um, where people will push, people were pushed into the fringes and into more boggy and mountainous areas looking for a place to farm and house themselves. Um, following that, World War II, um, shortage of British coal, we had to look at uh, becoming um, our own fuel security, so uh, the bog started to be cut for turf. This eventually led to the mechanisation in Bordemona. And finally, the kind of last link in our relationship is this carbon sink, the scientific research that shows that bogs are carbon sink. So these are kind of quite interested in that shift, the idea of the relationship shifting from from one thing to another. Um, get this to move on. So um, Marina Carr, she's a, a playwright um, and in her plays she uses bogs as a symbolic space and a place of violence, um, which is not dissimilar to the poor man here on the right, the Tulland man um, who found his end in a Danish bog. Um, there's a professor, P.V. Glob, who wrote a book uh, about the bog people and uh, he he surmised that in bronze and iron age bogs were sacred places with many religion, religious ceremonies taking place there including the burial of ritual human sacrifice victims to hasten the coming of spring and ensure the rhythm of the crops uh, so most often more often than not these were men and they were thought to have been sacrificed as husbands to the earth goddess Nertos. Now, I'm sure maybe I could be slightly off there, but we've got archaeologists here tonight. Um, Seamus Heaney was, was fascinated with P.V. Glove's book, and he 
in a lot of his poems, when he was writing about the North, he used bogs as a metaphor to explore the troubles. And it wasn't always kind of a positive thing. Uh, it was quite sinister. Um, so that's another element that I'm quite interested in. I'll just move on here now. So uh, just, I think it's the idea of landscape and what it is. And I think it's kind of important to, to question what that is, think about what it actually is. It is a link to our past, our heritage and our histories. Um, it's a rep the representation of the landscape kind of came about from the industrial evolution. Uh, when the idea of the rural was considered as an escape or an antidote to city life. And as a result, a lot of depictions of the rural at the time were quite idealized. So I'm just going to show a few artists, other artists that work with bogs. Um, so down here in the bottom left is T.P. Flanagan. Um, he was a great friend with Seamus Heaney and Heaney even dedicated his poem Bogland to him. There's a little extract of it there in the bottom right. Monica DeBat, she's involved with the Community Wetlands Forum as well and creative Ratanga Metal. Um, Katrina here on the top left, she works with analog photography. Um, she cuts up the negatives to create a kind of a collage effect. And she uses this idea that the bog itself is a dark room. Uh, Veronica on the bottom here, uh, she, her book, Observing Offaly, has a lot of images of Borden and Mona wagons drawing peat in Offaly. And I think, I think you've seen Sean Kane there tonight. I think Sean does quite a lot of work with um, um, looking into the Borden Mona wagons and the trains. He's got a huge interest in that. Um, also, here's James Freyher. He did a book recently about Darren Lock Breaker Factory, shot the entire project in black and white. Um, Martin de Port Wright is a painter and a sculptor, and he uses peat and turf as a material within his practice, as you can see here. Um, Pamela, she does a lot of work with the Midlands, exploring the Midlands, and she's a lovely aesthetic that I kind of really like, it really resonates with me. So Tina Coffey, um, she makes these otherworldly kind of images with macro photography. Uh, she's a new book out for pre-order at the moment called Portal. So if anyone's interested in that, just check that out. Uh, it's always helpful to, for someone to pre-order your book. Um, I'm not the only artist in my family. Uh, my sister has been an, an artist longer than myself. Uh, she's a painter and she did a lot of uh, bog landscapes back in her day. It was a mixed media paintings on canvas. So... Um, just want to kind of look into this idea of Irish identity and bogs and how it kind of all relates. Um, like when Ireland was a new nation following centuries of colonization and a bitter civil war, it was keen to move forward and develop a strong sense of national identity. Paul Henry's paintings are picturesque and they feed a sense of order and harmony, which provides a reassuring sense of security. This might explain why his depictions of Connemara become almost synonymous with visions of Ireland in the early days of the Irish state. In many ways, it was the original wild Atlantic way. These paintings by Paul Henry show a landscape divided people, but the marks on the land through the, is, is fairly obvious there from the houses and the reeks of turf. So these are some more of Paul Henry's images, but they're a little less quaint and show the true hardship of a life lived on the land. Um, so this is a, a, a painting by Sean Keating. The idea of a new modern Ireland kind of embraced progress in the early days of the new state, um, and Ireland was keen to assert itself as a forward-thinking nation and eager to move away from a legacy of colonisation. So technology and modernisation were key, and Ardner Custer became a kind of a symbol of modern emerging Ireland. Ireland is a modern, modern young nation is explored in this depiction of Arden Crusher by Sean Keating. And I think it's worth noting that when this was built, Ireland's electricity was 100% renewable at that point. Um, so further kind of modernization occurred in the 20th century with the rural electrification scheme. 
with the setting up the board of Mona and the mechanization of turf cutting and then joining the EU in the 1970s, among other things. Um, so many people will be familiar with John Hind, uh, his idealized depictions of mid 20th century Ireland evoke a kind of stereotypical nostalgic sense of Irish identity. His color postcards of red-headed children bringing home the turf in their Sunday best were at, were at the time imaginings of a rural island that was no more. These de nostalgic depictions seem to tie in with the cultural imaginings of the Irish immigrant longing for the homeland. This nostalgia is depicted in rural Ireland. It was quite commonplace at the time. Uh, the Quiet Man by John Ford had a similar aesthetic. Aer Lingus also kind of drew on that whole idea for quite a long time in their early days. Um, moving on. Um, so modern day landscape and documentary photographers are less interested in aligning their work with ideas of what the landscape should be. Um, the everyday and the ordinary are celebrated and represented a lot more. Artists are also not afraid to engage with social and environmental issues. So, Bog's artifact. Turf and brickheads may become a thing of the past, but they have been a significant part of Irish life. Joseph Boys came over in 1974 and he made this piece called en Irish Energies with Butter and Briquettes. Now, that's not the actual one, that's a reproduction in 2007. Um, uh, the footing of the turf, I think there's a kind of a workmanship in the footing of the turf that's not dissimilar to the walls in the west of Ireland. So I thought that was an interesting connection there. Interference there. Um, so turf has been used for centuries, not only to heat homes, but also to build them uh, in terms of blocks, bricks, and insulation. And we'll carry on with this idea of Boggs artifact. Uh, I've been experimenting with handmade peat paper for about a year now. And here are a few paper pieces with floral inserts, like bog cotton and heather and ferns and stuff like that. I kind of went uh, a bit mad with this lately. Um, I'm currently experimenting with kind of making three dimensional work with the peat paper. So I started out making a mask out of the paper. That's it when it's wet. Um, and that went a bit further. So now I'm trying to make my own bog body as such. Um, this is a work in progress and it's quite recent, but you can see there, uh, this is when it was completely wet and it's starting to dry out and, and got some issues with shrinkage, but uh, it's a work in progress. So we'll see where that goes. Um, I kind of like the idea of this work uh, and the metaphor of how it ties in, how like nature's fate and our own fate are interconnected and the idea of skin being, and it, it, the bog being a kind of a skin for the, for our environment, for our land as well, you know, so it's an interesting thing. So my photography project is called Beneath Briod, and I've been working on this since 2008 when I was studying my master's. Uh, it explores the bogs of the Irish Midlands and the culture around them. And it deals with themes of loss, change, duality, and resilience. It's, I've shot pretty much all of it on analog medium format film. Um, and this, the idea of archaeology is very important within this work, but more so on a, on a metaphorical kind of a level. So we we owed beneath we owed. I, I I didn't actually used to know the actual proper pronunciation, but a Gaelgor filled me in. We owed is an old old Irish word which translates as life beneath the sod, which I thought thought was quite apt. Uh, it's also worth noting that there's more than 110 30 words specific to boglands in the Irish language, so it shows how significant they are to Ireland. Um, my work also kind of deals with themes of disconnection and loss. Uh, it's something that I look at a lot in, in my work. I kind of seem to be drawn to images of accent, with a sense of melancholy or images taken in the key of, in the minor key as such, something like that kind of idea. 
Um, so the idea of the bog as a metaphor, it, can, it allows me to explore and examine a lot of different things. Uh, can explore Ireland, society, self. Uh, it's, it's very open. It's something that, that brings a lot of layers to the work that I kind of enjoy. Um, it's quite open. It's you look at the images, not just what you actually see. There's more to it. There's more implied by the work. Um, so tradition is also an important part of my work. Traditions and culture identity derived from foot and turf and cut and turf is an important aspect. And of course, the recent discussions about the ban on selling turf kind of stirred up a lot of debate. Uh, locally and regionally about how much longer we'll be allowed to cut turf and, and, and foot turf and there's a real sense of inevitability there and I think there, there is also a sense of loss of losing something um, and it's worth noting that for, for a lot of rural dwellers, dwellers saving turf is the last connection with the land that they have um, and for me, I, I, I kind of believe that the idea of social justice and climate justice, they must go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And both are important. So I have a few historical images that I've sourced from, from local people. And uh, this one's from 1972. This is Paddy Swan with Phelan's pony in Clonough Bog or Broadford Bog in Kildare. Paddy's actually, I think he's a He's a grand uncle of mine. That's what he gave me, mother's uncle. So, this is Carby Bog or Nocker Bog, where we have the committee, uh, or where we have the committee that manages the bog. And uh, this is from 1955. Um, and it shows a large reek of hand cut turf. So, you can just imagine the work that went into cutting all that turf. And of course, these boys are selling it. They're only young fellas, too. Um, so these images, I have a couple of images here. The next three images are all over 100 years old. And they show people hand cutting turf in our local bog, probably not long after it was handed over um, by the local um, gentry landlord. Uh, so our committee still manages this bog to this day. Um, so the only person that we actually know in this image is this man here in the background on the left. I reckon this is a man called Potch Kane, and he lived to be over 100. And in a strange kind of a way, one of the members is his grand nephew. One of the members of the committee is his grand nephew. So it's kind of nice to have an old photograph like that. There's another one, the next one. That's him there having a break. I'm sure it was hard work 100 years ago. Um, so how, how am I doing for time? Am I not doing too bad? About 10 minutes? Yeah, I have about two minutes left. Oh, that's bad. Only a couple of seconds left. Um, so this uh, idea of duality is something that's quite significant in, in my work. It's kind of come across it in a lot of different ways. Uh, there's a number of dualities um, that I play around with. The idea of man and nature, tradition and modernity, urban and rural, space and place, and then, of course, scale, a scale of, of extraction. Um, and also the idea of this loss of tradition and cultural identity alongside the environmental conservation. And although they seem at odds with one another, um, I kind of like to hold them together because I think when you put them together, you can kind of see there's an awful lot of common ground there. And I think bringing them together rather than separating them will actually help bring forward a solution. Um, Move on to the next one here. So this is kind of the the duality of the of the scale of extraction. This is hand cut turf in the west of Ireland. Uh, photographs by Amelia Stein. Um, so you can see that the difference is quite stark uh, for the amount of peat that's being extracted. Move on here. Pressing the button that this is what I need. So change. So our relationships with bogs is changing as we embrace conservation and it brings with it a sense of hope. Um, and kind of since our faith is bound up with that of the environment, it's crucial that we actually make this step. So I think a lot of turf cutters are aware of this. Um, and there is a kind of transition zone there that needs to be done. So I think it's important to acknowledge both of those things. 
Um, so that's pretty much it for me. So uh, going forward, I continue. I'm going to continue recording the remaining board and amount of infrastructure because a lot of it's been taken away. I'm going to try and record as much of that as I can. And any new or existing activity around the bog foot and tour for rehabilitation, all that stuff I'm interested in, all that, people's stories. Um, and I think change, recording culture and geographical change is, is something that's significant. Um, so I have, a couple, I have a couple of exhibitions coming up if anyone's interested. So in Kildare Town Library, I'll have an exhibition for the month of June. And in the National Museum of Country Life in Castlebar, I'll have an exhibition there from the 4th of July. Uh, I'll also have a piece in Dorheje Annual, um, which starts on 24th of May up in Dublin. Um, but that's it for me. So if you have any questions, fire away. And thanks very much, Aoife, and Community Wetlands Forum for, for having me talk today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Shane. Um, and God, you must be, you're, you're really busy with all of this <laughs> exhibitions coming up. That's fantastic. Really good to hear. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that myself. Um, you know, I always find it so fascinating how a, a nation tries to portray itself through through artwork and and how we tell our story um, to the rest of the world. And it's actually kind of fascinating now to see how we're, how artists are, are portraying it um, completely for what it is and what we see. So um, thanks so much for bringing us on that journey uh, this evening. Um, okay, so I am going to open up uh, the floor to our participants um, to ask our contributors any questions that they might have. We have a few in the chat that I might go through. Um, so feel free if you want to ask a question directly to um, one of our speakers, you can do just please um, use the raise your hand function um, just so that you can draw my attention to yourself. Um, uh, or if you prefer, pop a uh, question in the chat box. So I'm going to go back up to the start. So we have a good few questions. Um, this one really is for um, Ellen. Um, I don't know if she's still here actually or not. Uh, yeah, she is. Hi. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't see you there. Um, so a question, I think this is in around when there was images of um, some of the trackways um i think during the neolithic or no not the, the neolithic the mesolithic and yeah mesolithic and neolithic sites so how much peat um had developed above these mesolithic and neolithic sites and um, they appear very close to the surface yeah um some of them are very close to the surface um and the peat has been milled away so they're being they are, are exposed now the bogs are dome shaped, so you'd have a lot more peat in the centre of the bog. So and some and a lot, you know, we do find these Mesolithic and Neolithic sites met closer to the edge of the bog. So the peat at the edge of the bog, it wouldn't have been as deep as in the middle of the bog. Um, so there would have been meters of peat over these uh, sites, and then they were exposed through milling. But in Mount Lucas as well in Edra Clune, um, there are development sites. So the, the bogs would have been excavated out and then we would have found the sites. So the peat, some of the peat would have been still preserved over it. Um, so it depends really. I mean, yeah, they are being exposed on the, on, on the mill surface and they were being exposed on the mill surface, but it depends where they're, um, where they're located and they're generally located at the edge, which would mean less peat. I don't know whether Cathy is, yeah, the, I'm just thinking of the, the Neolithic yeah. track by Eder Clune that you showed. So that was about two and a half metres below the surface. And that was in a bog that had had a little bit of reclamation, but it, so um, just a little, not hadn't been milled or cut, but a little bit of reclamation. So there would have been some shrinking. And um, so it would have, you know, there was compression or compaction of probably the uppermost peat layers in that bog. And then but the trackway was about two and a half meters. But again, Ellen's right, it was at the edge because it was coming from the dry land from the edge into the fen. So it would have been a bit shallower there than out in the middle of the bog system that Eder Clune is in, where there might be like 15 meters of peat over if there was trackway out there. But that was about uh, two and a half meters when we found that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's fascinating because, um, you know, when you do see them, um, 
I suppose it's kind of surprising to see them so close to the surface. Um, so thanks for for giving um, an answer to that. Um, another one, um, I suppose, really for for Ellen and Kathy. Um, someone here would just like to know a little bit more about the uh, climactic changes of the Bronze Age, which resulted in the growing of trees on the bogs, i.e. the bog oaks. Um, they're not really sure where to, they can find information on this and maybe you might have advice on that. Um, so the bog oaks and the yews would have grown at the, the edge of the bog, really. They, they need um, nutrients, they need ground, uh, so, uh, prop, you know, nutrients to, to latch into to grow. So they wouldn't have grown actually on the peat. And then the, the bog would have developed over them and drowned them and they would have been the preserved in the peat. So you generally find the bog oaks near the edge of the bog. Um, they grew there just as the peat bogs were developing with, um, and then they were preserved. And then you find pines um, out in the bog during dry, when the bog dries out slightly. So um, we do find pines growing on the peat bogs, maybe during the early medieval period, when they think it might have been, um, it, it wasn't as wet. But we gen the Bronze Age was much wetter, so you wouldn't find uh, trees growing at, on the bog during the Bronze Age. We find um, trackways, bog oak or split trackways, man-made running across the bog during the Bronze Age, which may have been related to climatic change. Uh, we need to do more research into that. I don't know whether that answers your question. Um, where would we find? Where would you find more information? Uh, I sent I sent um Jamie sorry because I looked it up uh, just I, I sent him a link to um oh uh, good um, Royal Art, Ben Geary had a blog on the Royal Irish Academy Brilliant. website about Bronze Age climate change so it's probably a good starting point to you know yeah thanks Kathy no worries brilliant um okay so there are a few more there on on that um. I suppose, yeah, a, a question here um, on Le Monaghan Bog. Um, how would you assess the potential for additional sites being found in Le Monaghan Bog? Do you want to go, Ellen? <laughs> Each, the bog is, yeah, the... I suppose that they've stopped milling now, but as they were milling, each layer would reveal more and more and more and more sites. So as you go down, your your the whole landscape of the archaeological um, archaeological sites changes. But they've stopped milling now. So um, unless you go out and resurvey the bogs, you you know, I mean, if they are going to build wind farms, they're going to have to resurvey all the bogs again before they uh, they're they're allowed to build them, and then you would find more archaeological sites in the drain faces that way or on the field surface. Um, there's huge potential for finding more sites uh, in the bogs um, prior to any development that takes place there. Yeah, that actually leads into another question there from someone um, on the Monaghan Bog. It leads in really, really well um, that if there were, I suppose, there obviously are wind farm proposals uh, for, for the site. And if any part of the bog was drained, could existing archaeological monuments um, or the bog be affected or, or damaged by this? Yeah, they would be. Um, the, the, the sites are preserved because of the waterlogged nature that they're stable, they're in, you know, and if you do drain the bog, they, they are going to deteriorate and be affected. Um, um, but, we, but we haven't, yeah, there hasn't been any research into how they how draining bogs have would affect the archaeological sites we know so that's something that uh, needs to be needs to be done into the future and Kathy wants to add anything else in there yeah I, well I'm just thinking of um like in Lachine so Lachine mine when that was um when the Lachine mine started development in the 90s and this huge excavation there and there was part of Lachine bog was absolutely jam-packed with archaeology and they deliberately avoided it when they were constructing the tailings pond but there was a lot of archaeological sites excavated for the tailings facility but they built this big sort of um what would you call it? They basically put in measures to try and keep the area where they weren't excavating to try and keep the water table stable and high in that. They put in like a big like berm um, and big like pools, I think, as I describe it, to, to try and keep that area stable. But nobody knows if that has worked or not. And there's a couple of places. Um, so you, there's, there's measures that can be taken. They've been taken, say, in other countries, but nobody's quite sure how well they work if you want to preserve sites that you know are there. 
um, and, and you put in kind of dams and things like that in the bog to try and stabilize the water table, but nobody's quite sure how um, effective they are. But a little bit of research on a couple of sites in the UK, like at Flag Fen, which is a really famous wetland archaeological site, would suggest that those measures are maybe not that good. That the sites, once that the once that the the pH and the bacteria and the water table has changed within a peatland, that it's kind of changed irrevocably, and. That's not like that. It's in terms of archaeology. I'm talking about archaeology. So in terms of the chemistry that kept preserved those archaeology site archaeological sites it has changed, and therefore it's quite difficult to recreate that exactly and to completely perfectly preserve them. Um, but it's kind of it's something that's not really re researched in Ireland at all yet. Thanks, Cathy. Um, yeah, I suppose we move on then to questions for uh, Jules. On Drum and Bog, a lot of people haven't uh, heard of Drum and Bog before, so you're getting some good um, exposure there. Um, people didn't know that there was uh, a raised bog in County Carlow. Um, the question here is um, how much high bog is left um, on Drum and Bog? Um, I wouldn't think there's, there's not a huge amount that the, the, the surveys showed that it's it's like it's actually formed of two slight dishes, one deeper than the other. That's the base rock. So um, you can see at one end, it's quite, there is still a chunk that's pretty high when you're actually in, when you go right into the center of the bog. You're, it's probably five or six meters still over most of it. And there's the odd section where it would be cut down to maybe one meter to two and then there's there's the odd section where you can work out that it was eight to nine so um but it's not like um visiting a big midlands bog where you're met by a wall of peat you, you kind of walk in it's more like walking onto a small almost like a blanket bog and it's only actually when you're right in that you realize that that you have actually the gradient has gone up because you're kind of higher up with the tree line than you are when you walk in first so yeah yeah and yeah. you guys haven't done any um restoration work or, or anything yeah no we have we started yeah, yeah. um we we had um peatlands community engagement grant last year and on the back of the hydrology reports we have um the, a hydrologist who's based in kilkenny he's been monitoring the water levels for the last well actually all the way through covid covid slowed everything up um, and we did some drain blocking last autumn and already, um, well, I, I haven't been down now over the last couple of weeks, but you could see over the winter, there's pools starting to back up. It's a very degraded bog. It's covered very extensively with heather. So it's not like visiting some of the other sites, which is small flat pools and low mosses and grasses. But, um, but it's quite interesting because you get this kind of cross section like the pond Fiona was very interested in that because she said they must have dug down almost to the marl. So you have alkali and acidic and non-acidic plants growing on opposite sides of the pond. And it's something to do with the mineral content. So she said it, it very much echoes the original um, formation of how a bog would have formed in miniature. As yeah. I understand it, yeah. It's fascinating. <laughs> So it's every like every bog is different. I know it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Um, I don't see any other questions there actually for you, Jules. So if anyone does have any other questions for Jules, please pop them in um, and we can ask or you can ask yourself. Yeah. Um, Shane, there's a question here, I think, regarding one of the one of one of your photos um, of a piece of machinery or equipment. Uh, where is the peat separator? I can't remember what photo we were on at that point when when the question came up from Sean. Um, Sean would know know his stuff. <laughs> I messaged Sean there to tell him exactly where it is. Uh, <laughs> it's it, it's interesting actually that peat separator. Our local bog kind of has three sections to it. Um, the turf cutting section, which is a part of it, is privately owned. And is it's still milled for peat for horticulture by a private um, operator. So he's still firing away at that. And then there's another section, far end, which is a special area of conservation, 
Um, so that our vocal block has three different things going on currently. So yeah, yeah, so fair play. It's just a very unusual piece of equipment just to see it kind of uh, removed from a building. It's something like something you'd normally see within a peat work. So it's very unusual. Great photo. Yeah, it's in, it's, it's 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 Dutch. It's hard to get into the photograph because there's a building right beside it. I have to kind of it's at an angle, but um, yeah, it's it. it it's, and I use that, the stuff it dumps at the end, I use to make the paper from. So oh, all right, bad. very good. Yeah. No. So I use the bike product that they don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair play. Amazing what you can make out of but, uh, one man's waste is no man's treasure. That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, your, your bog bodies look absolutely impressive like what are what are you using as the i suppose the 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 models the molds they're like they mannequins or yeah. um they're mannequins and do you have to coach them with any particular um i don't know i only started like last year i was kind of making paper two-dimensionally uh with the inserts so i, I exhibited them last year and I, I kind of knew i wasn't finished with it so this year I said I'm gonna try three dimensional. So I I gathered up a few bits of mannequins here and there. I'd one that worked really well did the face that came off, that just slid right off. But it dries up so all the detail of the eyes and the mouth and everything's kind of gone. Um so then the other one actually where I did a larger one, it was a little bit more porous, I think. It, it wasn't as smooth. So I'm I'm thinking of varnishing it or something like it's I come up with a solution for it, but um I'm just playing it by ear, really, figuring it out as I go uh, and see what happens. Uh, and, you know, the teams in the work comes out when I make it, I, you know, I make it and then say, actually, what's this all about? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's fascinating. It's actually incredible just to see it there. <laughs> I think you probably saw my my, my jaw hanging open. <laughs> I was like shocked. Um, no, it's really, really cool. Um, there's a question here, actually, Shane, just where if you can say... Um, where your exhibitions uh, are taking place and when they're on. Sure. Um, at one Kildare Town Library um, in the town itself uh, for the month of June. Um, and that one's going to re be kind of more around the bog fires in the north of Kildare in 2020. So it's, the team will be slightly different. I'm going to kind of use a pagan kind of a team, an old team. And then I'm going to have one in the National Museum of Ireland for Country Life in it just outside Castlebar. And um, that'll be slightly more kind of documentary. That'll be more about tradition and modernity um, and that rural heritage um, that's not very well um, represented in, in, in the museum there because most of the, of the stuff they have is with Torf anyways is, is is kind of coastal and more blanket bogs rather than raised bogs. So there's a whole heritage there that's kind of unrecorded and kind of underrepresented as well. And it'll be soon gone, like particularly the border mono stuff. Like it's is it's interesting, even if it is highly intrusive and extractive, but it is massively interesting. I find it. Yeah, I have the RHA annual is on as well. That'll be starting. That's in the RHA in just off Stephen's Green. It starts on the 24th of May, but I've only one piece in that. That's a large um, group exhibition. So that's it. That's, uh, or just check my website out and um, stuff on that. ShaneHangan.ie. So. Yeah, great. I'll, um, I, when I send out the recording of, of this, I can send your. Uh, website as well and um, I can put the Drum and Bog as well website up um, as well so people can check out the projects that Jules has been doing um, on top of that okay um, if there aren't any more questions this is your this is your last chance um, there are a lot of people that are interested in going and seeing your work Shane um, so this is your last chance to ask any questions I think Sean um, you have a question there with your hand up, go ahead. How are you, uh, well, I suppose it's more of a just a, just a, a statement rather than a question, I suppose. Just to make this to take all three speakers, it's a very informative um, evening there. And I just have to say, it's, it's wonderful just the three different perspectives there. It just reinforces kind of, you know, uh, 
shame they're alluding to is kind of about the way that social justice and climate justice can have to go hand in hand. I think tonight's been a wonderful kind of um, demonstration of how, you know, you can put three kind of perspectives together and it kind of all ties in with the fact that, you know, while, the, you know, we all want to move forward and, you know, be progressive, that we virtually nothing that we discussed here tonight and learned about would be possible if it wasn't for, you know, the activities of the last 60 years. Like, it's just it's fascinating to see you know, the, the the way the different layers of the bog have kind of, you know, recorded our history kind of underneath our feet that we never realised over the years, you know, and just like to say thanks to all three speakers. It was fascinating to particularly learn about drum and bog because I never realised that you could legitimately uh, call a car a person a bogger. So, you know, from each and every people, uh, that's, uh, you know, we can kind of spread the, the, the slag in a little bit. So, no, just a, it's a very informative like now to all three speakers. And I just like to say thanks. Thanks so much, Sean, for your comment. Um, that's greatly appreciated. And uh, I can see all the smiles on the contributors' faces as well after that lovely co compliment. Um, thanks for coming, um, Sean, and everyone else as well. Thanks for joining us um, this evening. It's been great having you back. Um, and we'll be back again next Tuesday evening. Um, and we'll be looking at, um, at bogs and climate regulation. Um, so that'll be a little bit more of a, a scientific one, but um, it'll be absolutely just as fantastic as this one. So I hope to see you there. And thank you again to our three contributors. Um, I really enjoyed this evening, as I'm sure everyone else did as well. So um, thanks, everyone, and have a good night. Thanks so much, Shifa. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.